For most pro wrestling fans, the name Doink instantly brings memories of a silly clown gimmick aimed towards the WWF's younger audience. Whether being an evil clown or a silly goofy clown, it's still a clown. By and large, Doink is a representation of when WWE was heavily driven towards cartoony characters and stupid gimmicks. Fans who look closer though will see that the man portraying Doink, Matt Osborne, was truly ahead of his time and some of the heel promos he cut were truly groundbreaking. The world just didn't know how to react and instead thought, oh it's just a stupid clown. Doink the clown may represent, to many, a time when WWF was at a low point, but look beyond the makeup and you'll find not only a well respected worker, but a man who was battling his own personal demons. Under the name Matt Bourne, Osborne debuted on December 6, 1978 and wrestled for various NWA territories, most prominently for Pacific Northwest Wrestling, where he was their heavyweight and four-time tag team champion. In Mid-Atlantic Championship Wrestling on June 6, 1980, he won his first championship, also the first of two tag titles he would hold with Buzz Sawyer. In Mid-South Wrestling, he allied with Ted DiBiase and Jim Duggan as a member of the Rat Pack. Osborne first wrestled in the WWF on March 2nd, 1985, wrestling Rick McGraw to a time limit draw in the Boston Garden. He was primarily a jobber, though occasionally beat other jobbers at house shows. Many people forget that Matt Bourne was also featured in WrestleMania 1, losing to Ricky Steamboat and the inaugural granddaddy of them all. In May 1986, Osborne joined World Class Championship Wrestling. That September, he reformed his tag team with Buzz Sawyer under the management of Percival Pringle III, also known as Paul Bearer, to win a one-day tournament to crown new World Tag Team Champions. He also won the Texas Heavyweight Championship and defended the title at the Christmas Star Wars event against the Iron Sheik. It should be noted that Matt Osborne was well respected by his peers and a very skilled worker. He had a methodical approach to pro wrestling which is never seen today and his co-workers and fans spoke highly of him. There was something engaging about his promos too. They were unnerving and unsettling but loads of fun to watch. His in-ring work was technically sound too, something that many people forget after he put on the clown outfit. In 1991, Osborne signed with WCW and debuted as Big Josh. During his stint in WCW, Osborne won the United States Tag Team Championship with Ron Simmons and the World Six Man Tag Championship with Dustin Rhodes and the Z-Man Tom Zank. Osborne made his final pay-per-view appearance for the company on May 17th, 1992 at WrestleWar where he defeated Ricky Morton and continued to make sporadic WCW TV appearances throughout the summer of 1992 before leaving the company. In 1992, after Bourne's time in WCW was up, he soon found himself in Vince McMahon's office where the two dreamed up what was quite possibly the most preposterous character in wrestling history. Doink the Evil Clown. Funnily enough, Stephen King's It movie came out just a mere two years prior. Osborne was given a green wig, the full grease paint treatment and a full body leotard painted like a clown suit. When I started it, Bourne said years later, the only two people in the industry that believed in it was Vince and myself. I had a lot of guys make a joke about it, nobody took it seriously. Originally, Doink was a mean-spirited prankster, but a technically sound brawler in the ring. He spread his enemies with water flowers, he harassed fans, he finished his matches with an off-the-top rope butt plant, dubbed the Whoopi Cushion. But the gags weren't fun, they were cruel. Doink was the only one laughing in the end. Doink began feuding with Crush after attacking him with a prosthetic arm on an episode of Superstars of Wrestling, which subsequently resulted in a match at WrestleMania 9. During this match, another Doink, played by Steve Kern, came out from under the ring and attacked Crush with another prosthetic arm, allowing the real Doink to pin Crush. For better or for worse, this is still a WrestleMania moment that is remembered today. It was so ridiculous seeing two doinks in the ring, but it was also memorable for how silly it was. When I think of WrestleMania 9, I think of Hulk Hogan putting himself in the main event, and I also think about double doinks. After working against Bret Hart, Randy Savage and others, Doink turned into a good guy when he began mocking Jerry Lawler and making fun of Bobby Heenan. 
Shortly afterward, however, Osborne was fired for reoccurring drug abuses. His final TV appearance in the WWF for that era was on December 27, 1993, on an episode of Raw. Osborne cited in a shoot interview that Bam Bam Bigelow did not like putting over Osborne. Osborne said this subsequently led Bam Bam Bigelow snitching on him for smoking weed in the hallway of his hotel and getting him fired from the WWF. Osborne left the company but the Doink character continued within the WWE. Doink was played by Steve Kern, the Brooklyn Brawler and finally Ray Apollo. He was given a midget sidekick named Dink who was, it must be said, probably more popular than Doink himself. The character lasted less than two years without Osborne under the makeup. Without Osborne, the Doink act just wasn't the same. The weird layers of Doink were gone and it was really just a Doink costume now walking out there and performing. By the majority, when wrestling fans think of Doink as being silly, they're only half right. By replacing Osborne, the WWF allowed the character to become the joke that a lot of people wrongly thought it was. Following his departure from WWF, Osborne appeared as Matt Bourne in ECW for several matches as Doink in a blue and green clown suit, setting up an angle where ECW champion Shane Douglas criticised Vince McMahon for turning a talented wrestler like Bourne into a comic relief character and claimed that he knew how to bring out Bourne's full potential. Bourne then made a few appearances with Douglas as, quote, himself, sporting his face half painted with the Doink makeup. Bourne now had developed borderline personality disorder from having been forced to wrestle as a clown. His ring name under this gimmick was Born Again. It was a gimmick that seemed to fit perfectly with Bourne's real life personality and skill set. Matt could play someone with psychotic issues better than almost anybody at the time. It was he that got the Doink gimmick over as well as it did in the World Wrestling Federation. This stuff was absolutely brilliant and you should really go out of your way to watch Matt Bourne in ECW. I feel that this really could have worked well in the Attitude Era too. A man who has been completely ruined by WWE, forcing him to be a clown to the point that he develops psychotic traits. Only Matt Osborne could have pulled this off. That's how good he really was. As the character was continuing to grow and develop, Matt Osborne vanished from ECW. What happened? Well, it all depends on who you believe more. According to Matt Osborne himself, he was offered big money to do a tour of Europe and he simply couldn't pass it up. He was let go from ECW with the blessings of Paul Heyman himself. Osborne went on to say after the one month tour was concluded, he was promised he could have a spot back in ECW. The thing is, according to Matt Osborne anyway, he called Paul Heyman several times and Heyman never returned his calls, thus putting an abrupt end to the Born Again character. Others say it was a little different however than what Bourne describes. Some have claimed that Matt's drug addiction was spiraling out of control and was becoming somewhat of a headache to deal with at the time. Remember, Matt was fired from WWF for a similar situation. He became less and less reliable in the WWF and after repeated chances to get clean and sober, Vince McMahon finally pulled the plug on Matt Bourne's WWF tenure and gave the gimmick to Steve Lombardi and Ray Apollo respectively. After leaving ECW, Bourne appeared sporadically on the independent scene for various promotions and at several reunion shows. During his work in the indies, he would portray a Joker-like character, furthering the persona of a man broken by the WWE clown gimmick. He did, however, reprise the Doink the Clown role in WWE at Raw's 15th anniversary show where he took part in a Legends Battle Royal. During his years in the public spotlight, Osborne wasn't afraid to discuss his personal struggles. Specifically, he often talked about how he was addicted to drugs. He claims he made several failed attempts to quit using on his own. He also shared that he was admitted to rehab at least once. However, it seems that the time that he spent at the White Deer Run facility in Pennsylvania did not ultimately help him get clean. Drugs would end up playing a factor in Matt Osborne's death. Matt Osborne died on June 28th, 2013. There isn't many details on exactly what happened on this day. It was about one month before he would have had his 56th birthday. Reportedly, his girlfriend woke up that morning and found Osborne's dead body in their home. The authorities were called and an autopsy was scheduled to determine the cause of death. 
Nearly two years after his death, in June 2015, the family of Matt Osborne filed a wrongful death lawsuit against the WWE. The lawsuit states the WWE is to blame for the wrestler's death. The paperwork filed by the family accuses the WWE of promoting violence, contributing to Osborne's negative state of mind that led him to drug abuse. In addition, the lawsuit alleges that the WWE did not do enough to make Osborne aware that repeated blows sustained in the ring could cause chronic swelling of the brain and other brain injuries. The lawsuit states that because Osborne did not fully understand the risks, he continued to wrestle and sustained repeated injuries. These injuries caused him to grow depressed and use drugs to self-medicate. WWE attorney Jerry McDivitt issued a public response to the lawsuit filed against WWE by the family of the late Matt Osborne. It appeared WWE was happy to go public in their defence in order to clear their name of any wrongdoing. Jerry McDivitt presented a similar argument against the Osborne case that he has presented in previous lawsuits of the same nature by saying WWE is being targeted by attorneys who tell wrestlers and their families there's hundreds of thousands of dollars to be made from lawsuits similar to those recently filed against the National Football League. These lawsuits are all different from the NFL. We never had anyone claim they had these kind of injuries until these attorneys did it. They did find the destitute, people who have no money, and told them there's money to be made. That's what's going on, and I feel bad for these families, because they think they'll make money off this, and they're not. Later in 2015, the family's case was consolidated with other WWE concussion related cases being brought on by the Cairo's law firm. The law firm has its own website dedicated to their ongoing class action concussion case. Still to this day, the firm attempts to sue WWE on behalf of ex-wrestlers and has been accused of shopping for clients. Sean Waltman said that at a recent wrestling convention, Carlos was seen handing out his business card to wrestlers in attendance. In light of that, it comes as no surprise that many of the wrestlers named as plaintiffs in cases are regulars on the convention circuit. Wrestlers named include Shane Douglas, Sabu, Demolition X and Smash, and even referees Earl and Dave Hebner. If we are to believe WWE and Jerry McDivitt, it would appear these law firms promised Matt Osborne's family that WWE would pay compensation for his death. WWE to this date has not paid any money to any ex-superstar who has been involved with the Cairo's law firm. And in the case of Doink the Clown, it was thrown out of court.